my first memory of thinking that something needed to change was when I was going to uh, primary school. So, you know, the first school you go to uh, after nursery and so forth. And I wanted to go to my, I, my parents wanted me to go to my local uh, school. Um, and I remember, this, I remember the local government uh, gave me an assessment. And they said, uh, and they said, well, we've done the assessment. And Miro, uh, you know, he had to fill out this kind of exa- exam paper. Um, and we questioned whether he can go to, to so-called mainstream school. Um, and I always remember my father. Uh, I can still remember now my father saying to them in the meeting, when he did the test, did you think about his access needs? I.e., he can't write very fast if you give him a time test. I.e., he can't turn the page of the paper when you give him the test. It'll take him 10 minutes just to turn one page. And they said, oh, no, we didn't think about his access needs. We just questioned his his academic attainment in line with, with, our, with our view of the education system. So that was a kind of sparking moment then for me to think about actually... When I experience barriers in my life, and it's something that I reflect on daily, they're, nothing, they're, not, they're not due to the way that my body functions. They're due to, the, to whether my access needs have been recognized and, they're there, and they're then are therefore met uh, with solutions. So, so that was kind of early memory. And then from that, I just became more involved in, in discussions around what it means to exist as a sale person. Um, and again, that was quite key when I was when I when I kind of entered my teenage years and started to think about things such as relationships, building social networks, uh, thinking about my sexuality, and so forth. And and continuously, I got to the point where I thought, actually, just because I've been uh, labelled as being a disabled person, people are treating me differently. But they're always treating me in a way of just framing the discussion around my body. Or the fact that I can't do this because I use a wheelchair. I started to think about, well, what's what's the alternative? How do you how do you argue against that? And that's when I was introduced to the social model of disability, which which recognises that it's the way society collectively organises itself that creates the barriers as opposed to the person's uh, uh, condition or health um, uh, or, or impairment. And then from that, I, I became involved in in various different social movements. Uh, predominantly around young people's issues because I was uh, I was obviously a young person, um, and then I went to do uh, bits with with uh, organisations that are run by and controlled by sale people, um, and I tend to always try to ensure that I work I work with organisations which are controlled by sale people because the history has shown us that many organisations of which I used to use and access when I was younger were run by non sale people, and actually therefore were in control of those organisations. And, and structure them. One thing that I've noticed, you know, throughout my years of, of being an activist, is this um, this relationship between yourself and the organisations or the institutions that you wish to change. And I think it's a dilemma that we all face um, as an activist, whether you do align yourself with, you know, for example, the state, if you're going to be an advisor to the state and try to create change, even though you feel that the state holds uh, a monopoly of power over over your life and so forth. And I think one thing that I'm, one of the most influential uh, writers for me is Noam Chomsky. Um, and I always remember one of, his, one of his famous quotes, which was, a radical ought not to disassociate themselves from the institutions that they wish to change. And not to say that I'm a radical, but I think that it, it, there is something quite key there in recognizing that when, whether we're talking about the state or whether we're talking about a commission or an organization or a group or a network and so forth, is that we don't see it as a homogenous entity. And we recognize that actually there are individuals who are like-minded, who do share our values, who maybe feel frustrated in the system as well, and that we can carefully pick our, our, our allies who we want to build solidarity with. Um, and, and that's what I've been doing for, 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 for so long, and I've obviously moved into areas of research and, and teaching and so forth. But I think whatever I do in terms of uh, you know, professional background or academic background and so forth is to try to retain that link to activism and social movements and to continuously question because I think it's a skill to be able to question and to challenge but I think it's probably the most important skill anybody should have uh, in, in society is that ability to, to question and to challenge um, and that's what I tend, I've, I've always tried to do with my work 
um, you know, and, and my activism and, and my education and so forth. I think some of the key writers were um, within the, within the within the world of disability uh, studies was the likes of Michael Oliver. Uh, one of his one of one of Michael Oliver, who was the person who coined the phrase the social model of disability. Um, one of his most famous uh, books, which I remember reading when I was when I was uh, probably about eighteen, and it kind of revolutionised my thinking on disability, was a book called The Politics of Disablement, um, and that kind of introduced me to this idea of 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 how ideology can affect the way we think about disability and so forth. So Michael Oliver is certainly up there. I also had the privilege um, of having my dissertation um, uh, at master's level reviewed by Colin Barnes, another another key writer in, in disability studies as well. And I think that uh, the another person who is, is very key is Jenny Morris as well, uh, a disabled feminist uh, writer who, who um, provided me with the opportunity to to think about uh, the intersectional aspects of my identity and how as the same person my social class my gender my sexual orientation all uh, and disability and so forth all affect the way that I think about myself and the way that I'm portrayed in society and that was quite key to it but I think that you know that I, I even outside of disability uh, studies um, there, you know, there are other key people, and I've had the privilege of, of working with activists such as uh, Zara Tard, um, such as uh, Clinton Farkasin, Tara Flood, people in, across Europe such as uh, such as Kafka in in, Bul in Bulgaria, uh, 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 Jamie uh, Bolling in Sweden, uh, John Evans in the UK, and so forth. And these are these are these are activists and campaigners who have really helped me to shape my ideas. On disability, um, and then as I as I kind of went through university and and, and uh, explored sociology and politics and so forth, I've I've had the opportunity of reading, and and listening to and watching uh, theorists and writers who have no connection to disability whatsoever, but I've started to be able to see the links between their ideas and the role of disability, and I think that's so key for all of us. Uh, interested in social justice issues is to recognize that, okay, just because I come from one background with an interest in this area, that I'm kind of disassociated with any other aspect of it. Because actually, for me, it's a case of trying to make those links, continuously making those links between what people within race studies talk about or gender studies talk about and how it links to disability. Because you can see from the point of disability, for example, you can see how our thinking of disability was heavily influenced by um, civil rights movements uh, around race, uh, rights movements around LGBTQ uh, and the feminism movement and so forth. So we can learn a lot from each other as allies um, and it's something that I try to, try to do on a, on a daily basis. I suppose one thing that was, was, was quite key um, for me was when I was I've, you know, when I was a young, act a young activist, because I'm, because I'm 28 now and, and getting old, but when I was a young activist at the age of, of kind of 14, 15, 16, uh, which is when I kind of started getting involved in kind of protesting and, and, and uh, organizations and so forth, is that I remember, uh, I always remember talking um, to people and saying, oh, it's, you know, we've got, we've got legislation and it's what we all campaigned for as disabled people, uh, activists and so forth. And I, always, I can't remember who said it to me, but always, I always remember somebody saying to me, um, what, do you think all the tail people wanted this legislation and were happy with it? All the activists involved. And I was like, naively, I was like, yeah, of course. And then I remember, um, and then later on, I, I kind of remember questioning it. And I realized, actually, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be uh, so naive or lazy in our assumption that just because we think it's a good thing, that everybody else is going to agree with us. We need to be open to that, to that kind of uh, discussion and, and critique. Because what uh, a great example for, for, the, for the disabled people's movement is that we had in the UK the passing of the Disability Discrimination Act. And that's a very key moment for the movement because you had half, you know, I'll say half very lately, you had an element of the movement that said, the legislation has been passed, we'll work with it to improve it because it's not ideal. And then you had another group that said, this is nothing that we campaign for. 
This is not like a, anywhere near what we wanted, and therefore we should be questioning it, and we should be questioning our relationship to those that sought for our advice and ideas in, in the creation of this legislation. So I spoke, and that and that's been you know a, a, a very key moment in my evolution to to not talk in in such um, you know kind of majority terms and talking about things which I just assume to be true and so forth and actually qu- go into that process of questioning and challenging and the great thing I always I always I couldn't I didn't know how to express it properly but then I always remember reading Jenny Morris um, uh, many years later and one of one of her great quotes which I, I I'm a fan of quotes and one of her great quotes was um, if you don't know your history you're like a leaf that doesn't know it's part of a tree and I thought that was that, that kind of revolutionized my whole thinking on my activism because it was about saying, I need to know the background to this. I won't know all of it, and it will be selective in terms of, because we can't, we can't we don't have the opportunity to, to read all of it and to, and to absorb all of it. But I must be able to justify my ideas and my vision and my views and so forth on the history of where we've come from and what we've achieved. And that's why I, I, you know, I think that I'm a great believer in thinking that Everything that we want in terms of creating that vision, in terms of creating an idea, has already been outlined. And it's just about going through our, our history and thinking about what it means in the contemporary aspect of society and to bring that together in order to, 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 to formulate something. And I suppose that was, that was a real key moment for my, for my learning. But I think the other thing which I think is so key to, to being involved in activism is to... Is to um, I'm thinking other like for this. It's I suppose it, it's to question the basis of your personal experiences, because it's so dangerous just to remain on the person on the personal narratives. Um, and I used to do that, and again, you do that a lot when you're a young person, uh, because you're kind of framed and forced down the view of saying, "Oh, talk about yourself, talk about yourself as a young person, and about your views and so forth." And then you just assume that that must be the experience for everybody. And of course, it's not not the case at all. So for me, it was about saying, if I'm going to go into a meeting as an advisor to an organization, or if I'm going to go into my, do my research, or if I'm going to go and question um, uh, or work with people, then all my ideas have to be at a level which bears relevance to, to, to other groups and to other, uh, and to other collectives beyond my own personal experiences. So we shouldn't necessarily be always, always down at the personal level of, tell the story of yourself or talk about this and therefore that will shape your ideas. It's about recognizing that this is my experience, these are my ideas, but do they bear relevance? Are there themes that connect, that cross over between what I'm saying and the audience I'm talking to or the individual that I'm working with and so forth? I think it's hard to, to question what, what I achieved. Um, I think I would probably leave that up to, to anybody who who uh, feels that they were affected by, by the by policies during that time, and of course, a lot of it was was um, uh, has led to the kind of catastrophe of where we are now in terms of disability rights. Although, of course, we there were, there were some there were some aspects that were uh, no doubt um, led to a level of of choice and control for disabled people, even if it was albeit um, small a small period of time. I suppose for me. It was a question of recognizing whether I am clear in the values as to what I want to to try to create or affect at the at that level, which was of course was was national government, um, and I had no intention of of assuming that it was going to um, lead to this utopian vision or lead to anything other than than small progress or indeed planting seeds and ideas into people's um, People's work and people's views and and so forth. So I think uh, I think sometimes, quite rightly so, people will be critical of aligning of aligning oneself to to government, um, and of being involved in groups that perhaps uh, are part of the core reasons to why disabling barriers are systemic within society. But I feel that as as a as a, as a campaigner and a researcher. If I can justify to myself why uh, I'm going into this room to engage or to work with, um, with with collectives or with parliamentarians 
of that ideology or of that nature, then that's the most important thing that I need to try to tackle. It's not necessarily to to justify it to other people because other people will make up their minds. But I think for me, it's a case of saying, will I waver or will my will my my values towards disability rights um, uh, kind of break up or fragment if I continue down this route? And for the six years that I was you know working in government, I I felt that my my in fact, if anything, I think that my vision of what it meant to be a disabled activist uh, was strengthened because I realized that actually there are different ways to be an activist. There are different ways to create social change. You don't just get it on the protesting and at the grassroots level. You also get it in the negotiating and trying to influence change in the institution that you effectively, you know, uh, ultimately want to affect and, and, and create a, a different direction from. So I think, you know, to, to summarize, I, I, I do, there are moments when I, when I feel that was I, was I a sellout, I suppose, is, is something that I would recognize. Was I, was I a sellout for working with, with, with the government and so forth, or, for example, for taking the, the MBE as, as, a, as a Republican as well, which is ironic. But I think for, for me, it was a case of saying, does this, does this allow me opportunities to talk to people who, at the end of it, may have no interest in what I was saying, and may have no interest in the in the ideas that I was kind of espousing, but at least I can say that I had a go at doing it. I had the opportunity of trying to influence, even if it didn't um, necessarily get to the to the to the point that I was trying to make to them. My ultimate goal, I think, is is something which I re referenced uh, before before, which is, I just want to be able to look back on my kind of work, interests, career, and so forth, and say, did I do enough to, to assist or to promote the importance of asking people to question on a daily basis? And I don't think I'm, I'm looking for, for a, a concrete example of, of, of my achievements in the future. I just want to be able to personally reflect on my own um, on my own journey and say, did it did it uh, hinder or uh, assist others to also question this notion of what power means and question this this notion of what does oppression mean and which side are we on? So my definition of ableism would be recognizing how the continual, I suppose, cascade of events that comprise uh, the expectations that are placed on, on us as people has led to this, um, I suppose, lens that advocates for valuing uh, certain bodies over others. And as a result, certain groups of people, uh, particularly those who are seen as less able or disabled uh, or don't conform to the expectations of normality are relegated to uh, to being viewed as useless, uh, non-conforming. Uh, and in return, that kind of leads to being seen as a disruption or a hindrance to the process of, of society. Uh, and there's many people who have written on ableism. Uh, and I think a, a great piece of research is the Dishuman Manifesto and the authors associated with that. And it explains how disability is is a reaction to that sense of conforming to normality. Whereas there is normality, there is a supposed way that we are supposed to exist, that we're supposed to think, that we're supposed to produce and participate and so forth. And anything that doesn't fit that mold is viewed as, a, as external to that and therefore is then subjected to violence or suspicion or scrutiny and so forth. And this can, uh, this can affect it in different ways. When you look at the way that disabled people have been treated historically in, within society, uh, questions over productivity, questions over access to certain services, questions over the notion of being a citizen and so forth, you can see how this particular lens, which, which changes depending on the, you know, the numerous events that we find ourselves experiencing, be that economic, economic or political or cultural and so forth, but the, the question is, is that for those who have tried to, ha to raise the prevalence 
of disability rights or raise the issue of disability as a human rights issue have had their views squashed or um, sidelined or indeed we don't necessarily attempt to be proactive in trying to support disabled people having uh, representation to challenge this notion of ableism. And that's reflected in terms of disabled people being uh, restricted from voting in election, uh, political elections. It's related to the representation of disabled people on political agendas at the local and national level. And it's this, uh, this, this question of whether disabled people deserve, and I say that in inverted commas, deserve uh, the, 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 the benefits that come with the, with the idea of citizenship and, and being, a, a, being a, a member of a certain society or a certain state. So all this has been constructed around notions of ableism and so forth to actually ensure that disabled people are categorized in a certain way, which, which we have come to understand as the notion of ableism. I think I, I think very much so they are they are the um, they are extreme contributors to the marginalisation that they people will face because when you when you phrase uh, marginalisation in words of tragedy or pity you don't necessarily uh, reveal the underlying causes of why it's happening you actually just respond to it by saying this shouldn't happen uh, it's a shame it doesn't happen you should be in a better situation. And then that's it, then you kind of move on from that. So the question of why it's happening and how to respond to it, I think is very key to it. And I wrote an article um, on the, the notion of disability pride, which I never actually published, but I wrote on, on the notion of disability pride. And I recognize actually that to be disabled is to be angry because you're angry at the way society is organized itself. You're not angry at yourself and you don't want people to to empathize perhaps with the with the with the the the, the so-called restrictions of your body or the way that you, you 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 process information and so forth but you are but you want people to be angry at the way uh we have allowed this level of injustice to be sustainable um throughout time so i think that the responses that are needed is to not necessarily just dismiss pity out of hand but to question why would that be a, an overriding drive uh, from an emotional point of view as the people's response to the, no, uh, to the issue of, of disabling barriers because we've seen how pity has led to institutionalization, it's led to segregation, it's led to overprotectionism uh, and also the, con the, the construction of, uh, of, of the idea of vulnerability i.e. that old sales people are, are vulnerable by default rather than looking at the, the, the context that the sales people find themselves in. So I think pity um, is is very is very key to this and has led to to examples of of further segregation. So I suppose what we need to do is is firstly question why would that be a response that we would have, as opposed to saying you should be al aligning yourself with disabled uh, activists and campaigners in order to question where the oppression is coming from. The question is, how do you personify um, uh, the, the, the cause of disability when actually the definition of disability isn't universal and therefore is, is not necessarily uh, uh, understood in, the, in those circumstances because, we've, uh, because, the, 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 because disability has been so uh, heavily reduced to uh, medical discourse and the medicalization, it's hard to try to to try to symbolize it into a certain area. I suppose the question then is, is that, um, where, where does that frustration come from? And when I say that I'm angry at a disabled person because of the way society has collectively organized itself to, to marginalize individuals, I'm probably saying that I'm angry at, at you and I'm angry at um, people in my family and I'm angry at society and so forth. And not in a way that I've, I'm, I'm I mean, kind of stereotyped in the in the way of being the miserable, angry uh, villain, but actually to say, hold on. And I think I might have said it in the last interview as well. Is is that there is there is a continued way of working which is contributed to this continual marginalisation, and it's reflected in our view of what is the purpose of, uh, for example, health and social care. What's the purpose of the education system? What's the purpose of 
of uh, contributing to society. How does that look? Does it look? Uh, how does it? How does it link to uh, employment and so forth? So my anger and frustration, I suppose, and, and what I want to symbolise is perhaps the uh, the disregard by by the majority in the world who do not question this injustice or perhaps feel that they are doing something by, for example, reinforcing the tragedy or the pity of disability, giving money to the to the charities for disabled people as opposed to the organizations of disabled people and so forth. And I think that's where we need to get to. That's what we need to try to highlight is that the, 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 the prevalence of disability, the cause of it, how it's manifested and how it exists in society, how does that affect you as an individual, whoever you know, whoever's listening to this, as much as it affects me as a disabled person as well. And I think that's where we need to try to direct attention to. It's also questioning um, how beneficial are your reactions and contributions to challenging disablement. So, for example, giving um, giving. On the one hand, yes, we have uh, extreme marginalization of disabled people in society. Uh, disabled people are overwhelmingly represented in poverty and so forth. And then you have these kind of charities and organizations and so forth, which are not led by disabled people, uh, but actually have a, have a strong presence within the community. And they ask you to give money to try to tackle the issue. But the question is, is then, by you know, if you give money to a, to a traditional charity, which is, may have a history of actually um, incarcerating disabled people in institutions and so forth. And then as an individual, one feels that, oh, I've done my bit. I've recognized as an issue. I've tried to contribute something towards it to address it, uh, which is typically in the kind of monetary transaction towards a charity. And then you feel it's, then, then you feel like your part in that is justified. But actually, it can lead to further marginalization. It doesn't get to the causes we just kind of um, uh, emphasized and talked about. So there's a bit, there's something here around Trying to, trying to raise the issue of disablement, not just on, at a micro level, but also in recognizing actually what is this doing to affect the way that you think and behave and feel and value things in society as much as it does to actually those who are um, unfortunately uh, heavily marginalized and segregated in society. So I think it's something about how do we recognize the, dif the different levels of contribution that we're making or the different levels of awareness that we are trying to raise in this in this discussion around the notion of disability. You know, before the Enlightenment period, which is when we saw the um, the, the significance of science uh, and experimentation um, come forth in terms of trying to explain uh, how we are and why we exist and, and so forth. Uh, we did have you know, the, the reliance on, on, on religious texts and so forth. And of course, as you highlighted, disability was portrayed as a, as a, as a negative consequence uh, within, within that in terms of either tragedy, pity, um, evil behavior, uh, and punishments and so forth. But I think when people kind of praise the Enlightenment period and say, oh, we, you know, this, this led us down a route of medical advancements, uh, interest in technology, issues around you know, uh, continuously questioning and so forth. Well, actually, all the Enlightenment did was just to say there is a group of people who are, are abnormal and they are different, and they are different because of their bodies and therefore they should be treated differently. Um, and that then kind of led into our, uh, our experiences of eugenics, of um, institutionalization and so forth. So one thing I think is quite key for the history of disability is how disability has changed and manifested into different experiences um, for the person, depending on the, the, the kind of place in history, whether that is the text, whether that is the advancement in, in medicine, whether that is the Industrial Revolution, and how we went from uh, cottage-based industries, which, uh, for example, in the UK, we know uh, from, our, from our research that still people were still you know, marginalized, and they were, they were overwhelmingly... Um, uh, uh, you know, down the hierarchy in terms of the community, but actually they were given roles that that were related to, to to aspects that they could do, to their skills, their access needs were taken into account because of what they were doing at the community level. But what you saw with the industrial revolution and idea, uh, you know, and and therefore the ideals of of capitalism and 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 
and neoliberalism and so forth is this notion of standardization. And when you have standardization and you have a certain way of how things should be created and processed and produced and so forth, well then through standardization you have to have um, abnormality and you have to have things that sit outside that standardization. And the question for disability was, well if you can't keep up with the demand and the, and the vision that I as an ableist individual with power has, then the question then is what do I do with you? And that's what led to the, uh, to the increase in institutionalization. Um, it's what led to different political ideologies taking it. Because, you know, for example, this is not just an issue for, for the right in terms of um, segregation and uh, eugenics and so forth. And we, we, we saw on the left as well that there were plenty of arguments for, for a case of for institutionalizing disabled people uh, and widespread uh, agendas on that front because everything was linked to this idea of productivity. And now I think as we go into this world of the, the post-human, questioning what it means to be a human being, questioning why do we place the human at the center of attention when actually we're talking about a world and a social world within that, I think now is the time that we can start to evaluate and redefine what it means to be a human being, what it means to be productive, what it means to be valued. And I think as, as many other authors have, have, have also raised, is that we can use the notion of disability to challenge that, to disrupt the current ways of thinking. And as, uh, as one person says, uh, Professor Dan Goodley, is to reboot our sense of, of, of normality, reboot our sense of disability. We've seen you know, you know, a, an interest in universal design, usually not because of the fact that so people have been uh, poorly treated in trying to access services and access such devices and so forth. But usually, um, and I think it's a reflection of, of our attitude towards uh, the so-called nature of progression, is that people say, oh, it, it costs, it costs mo uh, better money in the long run because we're not spending time trying to, trying to redesign it later on in the, in the, in down, down, down the line. But I think what I suppose is quite interesting is, is Whilst I would agree to you to an extent that it does allow for for hope in terms of better access, in terms of disabled people um, having more choice and control over what they want to access and so forth, it doesn't necessarily mean that we should take it for granted. And I think this is where we have to recognize that our the, our lens, uh, our, our kind of economic uh, political lens on our actions and the and the actions that we take as individuals as well as uh, as collective communities and so forth it is so heavily reliant on this on this notion of economic productivity and therefore that uh, we desperately try to preserve economic productivity over our actions that we and our ideas that we have and I think that this is where we have uh, a, a danger because the point is then that many people will say. Well, should this be accessible for disabled people, and is it cost-effective to do so? And what's really the benefit of doing it? Because you hear so many times that people say, "Well, if you make your business accessible, then you're going to have this amount of disabled people use it." But that shouldn't really be the driving force behind it. The driving force behind it should be saying, "Hold on, there is a group of human beings here who are selectively not being allowed to access this environment, or not being allowed to to experience this the service, or not be part of this process." That should be the driving force because if we continuously go down this route of saying we should do it because it's better value for our, for our business, it's, it's, it, 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 it bores more or it bears more uh, economic productivity in the long run, then I don't think we're going to have a very strong argument in the long run because we've seen the expansion of institutionalized practice. We've seen still people being marginalized uh, further in terms of uh, accessing services to have choice and control. So this, this notion of universal design is, is very key to building an inclusive and accessible environment, but I wouldn't. I would. I would. I would raise uh, hesitation towards any view that just because there's a group of researchers over here or a group of businesses over here doing something, that therefore it's going to. You know, uh, I'm sorry to pick on it, but to, as you said, bend the arc towards towards hope and 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 inclusion. I, I'm I'm a little bit more skeptical of that. I think. I feel that there has uh, been a deliberate way of trying to 
portray disability in order to appease certain, um, of course, certain political ideology, but also to reinforce uh, or professionalize the services and um, and professionals that need to be involved in disabled people's lives and so forth. And I think you know the the question of saying you know will disabled people ever have the you know have parity with with some of those examples that you gave? Well, of course we know we do have disability um, uh, celebrations and marches. Uh, we have the Freedom Drive in in Europe, and there are many uh, groups across the whole of the world who will celebrate uh, disability. And of course, disability arts and the disability arts movement is a perfect representation of that, which is, of course, uh, art to, which explores the notion of disability and the issues relating to that. But I think that what is quite key and quite intrinsic in the context of disability is how much of our services um, and how much of, of, our, uh, of the professionals involved in, in services and, and how our systems, such as social security and so forth, are designed that without radical change within these processes, I don't think we'll ever have meaningful change which will be uh, long-lasting and sustainable. And I say this because, you know, as an example, like, I, I gave a, a talk a couple of weeks ago and there were other uh, campaigners who were talking about what does it mean to have a, uh, have a socially just social security system. And the problem is, is that for many disabled people, we live in a society which is not accessible. Uh, many people who want to go, for example, on marches and parades have no have no reality of ever going to them because they don't have the right level of support to do, to do so. And I think what, what's quite key is that if we have systems and structures which are supposed to provide tail people with support to do the things they want to do with your life, but the reality is, is that the majority of our, uh, of our support systems across the world are either not, not, don't exist at all or they exist to meet the basic needs of the individual. Then the question is, is how does a... How do I, as a disabled person, ensure that I have the right level of support to exist on a daily basis, but then also be involved in the conversations and dialogues around what does it mean to be a citizen of, 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 the, of where I am? What does it mean to be somebody who, who kind of flexes uh, my political interests? Somebody who is involved in these identity issues and social justice issues and so forth. Because there are so, there are so many structures that sales people have to navigate through. And so much of these structures are heavily reinforcing medicalized practice. They're heavily reinforcing this notion of, of the professional being involved and so forth. And we can have discussions on, on trying to, you know, sharing power and celebrating uh, identity and so forth. And, that, and that's absolutely needed to continue, these di to, con to, to continue this dialogue and also raise awareness and so forth. But I think there are some fundamental changes that are needed at a stru structural level, which are existing on the back of, of numerous events, which has taken us to where we are now, that I think that if we don't tackle these issues, such as social security, such as the education system, such as uh, issues around political representation and so forth, that I don't know how anything that will celebrate disability in the long run will be sustainable. We have now uh, skewed our understanding of welfareism. We've skewed our understanding of, so, of social security systems and why they exist. Um, we, they are laced with uh, issues of uh, scrutiny and, 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 and questioning uh, those that are on it to be inferior and therefore uh, that, we, that there, is a, there is a deserving and undeserving class within uh, accessing such services and so forth. And I also think that this is where we need to be reminded that the body, the human body now, is predominantly viewed as a site of investment by medical practitioners, by those who want to sell us goods uh, and, and, and so forth, those who want to be part of, 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 of cons uh, consumption and consumers and try to uh, assist us to, to explore aspects of that. So I think all of this combined will reduce the prevalence of the political argument around disability and the political construct of disability because no political party in the world actually uh, represents the, the, the view of disability from a social model perspective or views disability as one of social injustice. 
because you can have groups and, and subgroups within political party that kind of raise awareness of it, but they're drowned out. They have no option to actually try to influence and so forth. And we have this, you know, in my, I'm, I'm a member of the Labour Party, and I think that, that uh, the way that we tackle uh, or, or represent disability in our party is, is, is extremely poor. So I think we need to try to champion these messages, and we do so through social movements. We need to try to build an argument about what does it mean to have a socially just social security system? What does it mean to have an inclusive education system? What does it mean to actually be a productive member of society and question that notion of productivity and so forth? And to do that, we need to have solidarity. And we need to go back to that point of saying, this is, this is not about when it, when it conveniences you or when it impacts on you, then you're part of this discussion. It's very much a discussion for everybody right now. And I think we are in a, such a dangerous time to, um, to have any apathy towards these, these systems and structures because as is highlighted in disability issues, if you look at the advancements in disability rights, and this is why I'm, I'm, um, I, I'm a bit, I get a little bit uh, frustrated with the discussions of progress and celebration of progress, because if you look at disability rights, everything that's been achieved in the last 20, 30, 40 years is slowly being turned back. And that's not to say that we should just be, you know, we should all just be disheartened and that's the end of it. Because there is, where, wherever there is a, wherever, there's, wherever there is analysis and wherever there is an opportunity to question, um, question aspects of, of conformity, of power, of oppression and so forth, there is certainly hope within there and you can change it because nothing is, nothing is grounded. There is no actual structures within society. There are just events which are multiplied that we then understand to be this aspect of economics or this aspect of political ideology and so forth. So if nothing is grounded, then everything can be changed. And there is real opportunity to make change, to make progressive change for, uh, for social inclusion. But it very much depends on whether we're having these conversations. And unfortunately, I don't think we're, not, that we're having them enough. The disabled people's movement has become fragmented. Um, and to an extent, I, I would probably argue, slightly disillusioned with where it, where it's going to go in order to articulate its arguments and so forth. Um, and that's uh, not necessarily just a reflection of, of sale people's movement, but I think in the wider sense of the left, there is, there is a kind of dissatisfaction within that. I don't necessarily think it's, 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 it's a negative, although I've seen, you know, for example, in my own uh, PhD research, I spoke to, uh, to activists who said that I can't belong to, to, a, to this movement because it's so heavily related to left-wing ideology and politics. And I think that's, a, you know, that's an incredibly fair point. And, it's not, and I don't think the answer is to say that there is a vision for disability rights which can fit a left-wing agenda or a right-wing agenda or a centrist and so forth. I think it's more about saying if, if, the, if the dominant discourse at the moment is related to a centrist right-wing ideology, which in a lot of the a lot of our member states, uh, it's 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 certainly going that way. I think the ground that needs to be occupied is the alternative to that. And I think for the, for the disabled people's movement, I don't necessarily think it's about aligning with the left, uh, because you know, for for example, I although I am biased as being, you know, I would argue that I am left wing, um, and that politically, you know, I am I am of the left and so forth. Um, and a, a lot of disability writings and studying around disability was born out of, of, of Marxism and was born out of, of, of some of that um, uh, some of that political uh, ideas and 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 uh, kind of frameworks. But I think where we need to go now, so I'm not sure whether it's a weakness, but I think most certainly going forward, where we need to go now is to ensure that disability rights and the activists and campaigners need to be occupying that space which attempts to illustrate the current power systems and the current ways that power affects different communities and individuals uh, and collectives within society, and then offer that alternative vision and say, this is how society should be organized. This is what happens if we bring people together and build solidarity. I don't think it's a question of voting for utopia. It's a question of of building an, a vision which looks real. Because at the moment, 
uh, and I think I said this in the last interview. At the moment, a lot of a lot of the left have occupied the space where they said you've got to bring down all these structures because of all this oppress all this oppressive infrastructure and so forth. But they don't but they don't necessarily have a vision of for the you know for the person who belongs to a community who is who, who is who is marginalised and who actually doesn't actually have an interest in identity politics doesn't have an interest in the issues that we've been talking about and so forth. You have to be able to sell a vision to that person, to that family, to that community, and so forth. And I think that's where we've, where, where we're stuck at the moment is offering that because it's not. I don't think it's a utopian that we're looking for. It's just an alternative vision to where we are now. Not to say that we're going to bring people to a promised land because we're not. And I'm probably the first person who, when I got there, would think, well, I don't think this is promised. <laughs> and I'd be questioning it straight away. As a, as a sociologist, but I think it, it's more about saying, I just want to be able to offer an alternative to well, where we are now, because, because the situation now is, is on the whole so dire for disabled people. And it's easy to, you know, talking to me because I'm, you know, I, I am privileged. I'm white, I'm middle class, I'm heterosexual, I, you know, I, I went to university and so forth, I live in the West and so forth. So it, it's easy talking to me about it. But the majority of people who, are, who should be involved in these conversations don't get any opportunity to do so for multiple multiple reasons. But it's about hearing what their vision is for the future, what they want change to be, and then and then showcasing that to a wider audience. Nobody is, is able bodied. There are just some people who are who are temporarily non disabled. I think that's such a key thing to, to try to harness because it's about saying that actually this does affect you irrespective of wherever you think you are in this kind of you know, measurement of, of you know, inverted commas, ableness, which implies that you know, tell people are not able, which of course is not the case. Yeah. But I think, there's the, so I think there's something about recognizing that, that, we're, that this does affect all of us. We do know people who are, uh, who are facing barriers created by the way that we've organized our, our, ourselves and our society. And you do know that we are all going to be experiencing this, 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 this experience of disablement at some point in our lives. And what we need to try and do is to demonstrate to the majority, which is, of course, uh, those that have the, major that have the most power, is to say, who have the potential for the most power, is to say, are you prepared to accept a society which says this group will be placed in this locked institution? Are you accepting that in the UK, in the last few years, we have had evidence of young people under the age of 18 labeled with conditions such as autism or challenging behavior, in inverted commas, who are being uh, found drowned in, in bathtubs, in assessment and treatment units, and so forth? Because this is all out there. The evidence is there. I think the disability rights movement is just attempting to shine a light and saying, are you happy with this level of violence in society? Do you accept this level of violence? Because it's not cities burning, but it is people being found uh, locked in institutions. It's not uh, people being found in, 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 in toilets and, and arrested, but it is people being locked in their homes. And it's not to say that one group deserves more attention than another. It's to say that there is social injust injustice, and there are groups of people who pre have previously championed and uh, and, and protested and created social change through the various different uh, formats that social movements take. But what we have now is an opportunity to say that if you're unhappy with your life, whether that's due to the material uh, world around you, whether that's due to your sense of identity and your culture and so forth, then work with the people who also want change as well. And we can together build an, a, build an agenda for an, for an alternative way of producing and functioning and being in society, because this is going to this is going to affect you either now or in the short future ahead. Because there there is no other way that you can be uh, disassociated with the topic of disability, because it affects all of us. The dominant uh, role of health, um, which is to do with uh, ideas of rehabilitation, cure, prevention, um, and so forth, is is it can be at odds with the demands of the disabled people's movement in terms of 
prioritizing uh, choice and control, access to services, um, facilitating our existence to, to live, but not necessarily understanding the barriers that we face um, be, uh, due to the way that our body works. So I think, I, I wouldn't necessarily think I think it's at odds, but I, as I've said throughout the whole of this interview, is, is that we can question what it means to, uh, to prioritize um, aspects of the health service and to question whether we want to invest so much in curing X condition, whereas actually we could maybe perhaps discuss re, uh, using, that, using the funding and resources to ensure that people have the right level of assistance and support in their community. The internet is just a tool to be used. It's, a, it's a, what I would refer to as a blunt instrument um, because it can be used by, by anybody for, for a certain purpose if they have access to it. Um, I think what the internet has done uh, for disabled people is, is allow disabled people to access environments that they previously weren't able to access because of the way that society is constructed. A great example of this, I think, in terms of social movements and protest is when we have when we have an idea of protest or of kind of challenging oppression and power we think that it requires people to occupy a physical space to create that change and when i go to like a, when i go to a, uh, a disability rights event and there's probably four people in the audience and they'll say oh it wasn't a very good turnout was it and then you and then and then i think well that's because the majority of people who want, to, who want to be here can't get here. But they can access this environment through the internet, through, the, through those portals, in order to voice their ideas and voice their views and so forth. So I think the internet has, has uh, changed the way that we will think about uh, protesting, social movements, activism, and so forth, because it does allow people to access those environments. On the other hand, though, we have to recognize that um, the internet is not is not a, is not a freedom, and it is controlled and it is influenced heavily by certain agendas, and those agendas reinforce those notions of ableism that we've spoken about. So I think it it, it certainly has created change, and we can look to to aspects which are positive, but I think ultimately we need to remember that it's, it is just an instrument that can be used by anybody for for any purpose. I really struggled to engage with reading texts until I was about 20, because actually um, my access requirements meant that I couldn't, I couldn't hold a book, and I couldn't turn the pages of a book. So actually, only when technology uh, changed that allowed me then to, to engage with reading texts on a computer and so forth, or on a tablet or on a phone, was only then, only then I could try to rapidly accelerate my, my love of, uh, of reading and being engaged with reading. But the three books I chose were uh, two are two are nonfiction and one was fiction because I thought uh, you know I, want, I, would, I didn't want to include a fiction in a, as a, as a lover of of stories and fantasies and and and, uh, and films and and uh, and books and so forth. But the first one, which I think I did reference before, which is the Politics of Disablement by Michael Oliver, and it was just, it was just a way of trying to uh, document that that vision of of what disability means and how it's been rooted in, in the individualism and the medicalization of disability and how we want to move away from that. So that was, that was, that was quite key for me. The other book, which I think is, 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 has been groundbreaking for me, and it came out very recently, uh, but I loved it so much, was the book Who Rules the World by, uh, by, by, by Chomsky. And it was a way for me of, of recognizing how different aspects of policy development and different questions that we need to place on the roles that we have within society, how they uh, lead to further marginalization and so forth. And you know, I remember reading it and the, and the kind of, I only read it last year, but the first, I think it was the first chapter, and it said, and it said something like, what's the point of, an, of, 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 of university? Or what's the point of, of being a, a, a lecturer or a researcher? And it was like, yeah, this is, this is like summarizing all the things that I'm thinking all the time. And go back to that question you asked me, you know, what do I want to achieve in the future? It's to think about, you know, what is the point 
of this role? What is the point of this policy? Does do the parliamentarians that kind of, you know, bang the drum of or try to align themselves with disability rights, do they really care about what, what we're trying to talk about? Do they really align themselves with our kind of ideas and vision and so forth? So I think that was a really influential book for me to try to kind of conceptualize all the things I've been thinking about for many years. Um, and the last one, which is which is a fictional book, uh, is is one that I read. It was quite a while ago, I think. It must have been about seven, eight years ago. But it was a fictional book by um, Cormac McCarthy, and it's called The Road. And it's a book about um, kind of kind of post-apocalyptic uh, future. Uh, the story of, of of a parent and child going through this world, trying to try, all they want to do is try to get to the to to the coast in order to see the coast um, in this kind of uh, in this in this in this world of chaos and horror, um, and and trying to see the beauty within that, and what what I mean it was great because I like to read a book that makes me cry at the end of it, and it made me cry at the end of it, as do most of my fictional books that I read. Um, but what I thought was really fascinating with this book was that I I was able to see the significance and the importance of what I would refer to as a kind of the micro level of interaction and the importance that we must hold for how we interact at the micro level between us within our communities. Because so much of our work is, is viewed at the kind of abstract macro level, thinking about policy, thinking about state responsibilities and state intervention and so forth. But what we mustn't forget is that all we're talking about really when we drill down to it is interactions between human beings, which are then replicated, which are then reproduced to form what we think is, think of as policy implementation, what we think of as a state, as a government and so forth. But the most important thing when you strip it all back is the interaction between two, three, four, five human beings and so forth. And you know, for, for asking about where we want to get to in the future and what we want to try and influence, it's that interaction. It's keeping it at the, mac- at the micro level and thinking about how our actions, when produced and reproduced, cause these ways of existing and being in society, which are constantly fluctuating and changing. Um, and it was just a way of, of, of kind of shaping my idea that nothing is stable and fixed, but everything is in a constant flux which allows us then to try to think about the possibilities of the future.